Listen. You hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand. Begin and cease and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in. The sea of faith was once too at the full and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. published his poem Dover Beach in 1867. He took the retreat of the tide as his metaphor for the decline of religion in Victorian Britain. New forces at work in society were secularizing even the most elemental moments in human life. It became possible simply to register a birth without baptizing your child. To receive an education provided by the state to marry in a registry office, because marriage law was also being taken over by the state. Marriage was becoming a civil contract. And you might now be laid to rest in a municipal burial ground. It was becoming possible to live a wholly secular life. Arnold was witnessing the withdrawal of the world of gods and spirits that had haunted mankind since the dawn of consciousness. The National Census of 1851 recorded the beginnings of a slide in church attendance which has continued. It found that the proportion of the population attending worship was 42%. Roughly, by 1900, it was 24%. In 1965, 11% and in 1981, 7%. The church, which once controlled the whole of society, has become marginal, a remembrance of the past, in today's man-made world of ceaseless change and movement. Arnold would have been startled by Dover Beach today. This restless new world, based on science and technology, first appeared in Arnold's Britain. Today, of course, it's dominant everywhere, and it's plunged all older faiths and cultures into crisis. Why is that? It's because the new world owes its success to an insistently questioning, skeptical habit of mind which regards all beliefs as guilty till they're proved innocent. And this has had the effect of fatally undermining people's confidence in the old certainties that they used to live by. Today, many people don't know what to believe anymore. I'm what they call a philosopher of religion. As a Christian, I want to know in what form, if any, Christian faith is possible for us today. As a philosopher, I want to know what view of life and what basis for values still remains to us. So, in these programmes, we're going to pick out a number of key turning points and a number of great thinkers. Tonight's programme, for example, will fasten on the moment when the old religious view of the universe finally broke down and the new scientific worldview began to replace it. 
As we go on, we'll give as much space to the atheists as to the believers, because they deserve it. They too have had to fight for a new philosophy of life and for new values. Now, Matthew Arnold was not just one of those romantic conservatives who wring their hands over what's being lost. He also tried to reconstruct. He wrote books of radical theology. And we'll try to be constructive because we'll tell the story in such a way as to show the shape of the new reality that's emerging. A first hint's going to come in this program because we'll see the very beginnings of a process by which our whole view of life becomes more centered within man, within the human subject. So now, let's make a beginning. Western culture has been so secular for so long that it's not easy to recall what a fully religious view of the world was like. But here's an image of it. I'm at present out in the profane, neutral, public world of the street. But we're about to cross a frontier. Every arch, gate or doorway symbolizes the transition from one world to another. Lich means body, and the lich gate was the place where the corpse rested, waiting to move into its last home. Our space is measured on an abstract metric scale, but these spaces are ordered on a scale of degrees of sacred meaning. The churchyard is an intermediate place between the worlds, where the dead lie sleeping, waiting for the Lord's coming. At the west door of the church, we cross another invisible line and enter the sacred world. The layman taking his place in church becomes part of the same symbolic movement from earth to heaven. He's a member of a pilgrim community who march toward their destination. The crucifix above the chancel screen is yet another symbol of the passage from the earthly to the heavenly worlds. It's through the cross that people pass from earth to heaven. From now on, those who officiate in worship are clad in the white of heaven. Now it becomes steadily more awesome as we come to the railed off sanctuary. Rising steps indicate increasing degrees of exaltation and holiness. Here are the images of Christ's sacrifice, the reserved sacrament, the very body of Christ, and the perpetual flame of the sanctuary lamp, which represents the presence of God himself. Now imagine this experience of rising degrees of sacredness, rich interconnected symbolism, hidden analogies and correspondences, sacred powers and influences, all becoming so intense that it governs your whole way of thinking about space and time, about society and the universe. The medieval world was something like that. Where we see the world in terms of mechanisms and mathematics, they saw the world in mythical, magical, religious terms. For them, the supernatural world radiated out a kind of sacred organizing power which structured all their experience of space and time, the world and society, and the individual's life story. The old Christian view of the universe was a mixture of the Bible and Greek science, coming especially from Aristotle. The universe was a perfect sphere, over a hundred million miles across, made of a glassy material called the quintessence. Within it are the seven heavens of the various wandering planets. But none of this was dead, empty space. These are the crystal palaces of the blessed dead, full of life and movement. But their movement was not their own. The universe had to be continuously powered from outside because Aristotle had argued that every motion depends upon a previous motion and so on back until you come to an unmoved prime mover, namely God. This was the argument from motion for the existence of God. 
all motion was transmitted down from God through his angels, through the starry heaven and the seven heavens of the wandering planets, ultimately to power all events down here on Earth at the dead center of the universe. Above the land on Earth are the spheres of water, air, and fire, for everything below the moon is compounded of these four elements. Earth is corruptible and changeable, but the planetary heavens are everlasting. As they turn, they hum with the music of the spheres, and they power events on Earth. In fact, this was a worldview in which astrology made sense. Heavenly influences are channeled through the zodiac and the planets to reach every aspect of human life. There is a secret harmony and correspondence between man and the universe. Here, it's through the signs of the zodiac that the blessing of Christ radiates out to the entire cosmos. Meanwhile, Hell was seen as an inverted mirror image of the seven heavens, its circles descending to the opposite pole of the universe from God, where Satan lies wedged at the center of the earth. Medieval man saw the universe as incorporating a value scale. As the world of evil lay below him, so rank upon rank above him, the heavens ranged up to the throne of God. Wherever you looked, you saw rising degrees of being, value, authority, power. In such a world, it was impossible to doubt the existence of God. A scale must have a top. The mountain peak must be there, even if veiled in mist. The world was like a sacred text, full of signs and hidden meanings. The person who could tell you what it all meant to you was not the mathematician or engineer, but the theologian, the interpreter of scripture. The medieval view of the world gave cosmic backing to the authorities in church and state. Here, painted round the outside of a Romanian church, the heavenly and earthly hierarchies mingle on the ladder linking heaven to earth angels, prophets, apostles, bishops. The authorities on earth are legitimated from above, tying the social order into the cosmic order. God himself had founded the church, establishing its ministry and its sacraments as channels of grace, flowing from the highest heaven to the humblest peasant. In parts of Eastern Europe, where something of the old order still survives, we can glimpse what it may have been for a whole civilization to have been built on these people, their bond with the soil, their dependence on nature and the protection of their lords, their folk traditions and their faith. At Rome in 1600, in spite of the Reformation, the old order still held. Theology was still the queen of the sciences, and all branches of knowledge were subject to church control. Knowledge was politics, and a break with the traditional worldview could not be made without a power struggle. That's why the career and fate of Galileo are still of such importance. Galileo Galilei was born in 1564, the same year as Shakespeare, and he lived and worked in and around Pisa, Padua and Florence. Galileo combines a passionate interest in the physical world, craft skill, and power of mathematical analysis. You can imagine him as a creative man, but also arrogant and always highly strung. He's devout, but he's wily, and he understands the politics of the system he lives under. Galileo's hero was not Aristotle, but another of the Greeks, Archimedes, engineer and mathematician because Galileo no longer lives in the old medieval universe. 
His world is a world in ceaseless motion, where every movement of a body obeys mathematical laws that can be experimentally demonstrated. There is in nature perhaps nothing older than motion. Nevertheless, I have discovered some properties of it which have not hitherto been observed. Having placed a board in a sloping position, we rolled a ball along it, noting the time required to make the descent. For the measurement of time, we employed a large vessel of water. To the bottom of this vessel, we fixed a pipe, giving a thin jet of water. And this we collected in a small glass during the time of each descent. The water was weighed on a very accurate balance. The ratios of these weights gave us the ratios of the times. We now rolled the ball only one quarter the length, and having measured the time of its descent, found it precisely one half of the former. Next, we tried other distances, and in such experiments, repeated a full hundred times, we always found that the spaces traversed were to each other as the squares of the times. And this was true for all inclinations of the plane. Aristotle had had no proper concept of acceleration. He just thought that a falling body's speed is directly proportional to its weight. He was wrong. Galileo had analyzed acceleration mathematically. At this and dozens of other points, Galileo launched a determined attack on Aristotle's natural philosophy. He wanted to show that behind the appearances of nature, there's nothing but a mathematical order. So he began to work out the laws of motion that Newton was to finalize. The implications for theology were considerable. In Galileo's new and dynamic vision of the universe, motion is built in and perpetual. A body that's moving stays in motion until something stops it, and then action and reaction are equal and opposite. Motion is conserved. It's no longer necessary to appeal to the action of a prime mover who keeps the universe energized from moment to moment. And so Aristotle's old argument from motion to God breaks down. It's possible for secular science to explain the workings of the world without having to defer to theology. Science thus began to escape from religious control. The crisis came when Galileo turned to astronomy, where he joined the followers of Copernicus. He was the first to turn a telescope upon the heavens. What he thought he saw again convinced him that Aristotle must be wrong. He saw not the closed, earth-centred universe of the Middle Ages, but the universe of Copernicus with countless stars scattered across infinite space. Galileo was the first to see that Jupiter had four satellites, and he recorded their positions in this notebook each night during the spring of 1610. It was like a little working model of Copernicus's solar system. And if Jupiter could carry satellites with it as it flew through the heavens, then the Earth could itself also be one of the moving heavenly bodies carrying its own moon with it. Our own eyes show us four stars which wander around Jupiter as does the moon around the Earth. We shall prove the Earth to be a wandering body and one that surpasses the moon in splendor and not the sink of all the dull refuse of the universe. For his proof, Galileo relies on one science only, mechanics. Ideas of value and purpose were irrelevant. Galileo committed his successors to seeing the world as a machine. The new vision of the universe was disturbing. Some thinkers were speaking of the universe rather than God as infinite and eternal. For this heresy, another follower of Copernicus, Giordano Bruno, had been burnt at Rome in 1600. So Galileo's discoveries were easily seen as threatening. Churchmen argued that he was too dogmatic in attacking Aristotle, that he couldn't prove the truth of his own views, and that in any case, scripture said the earth was fixed. In 1616, according to a Vatican document, the commissary general of the Inquisition obliged Galileo to promise not to hold, teach, or defend 
the doctrine that the sun is immobile and the earth moves. This action was illegal, and the document bears no signature. Nevertheless, it would later be used against him. Galileo was a notable public figure with plenty of friends in high places, including the Pope. He was a loyal Catholic, but he was determined to promote his views. So, in 1632, he published his Dialogues Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. Having first got the proper imprimaturs from Rome, he should have been all right, but the book caused a storm. A commission had a look at it, they turned it over to the Inquisition, and Galileo was summoned to Rome. Meanwhile, his enemies among the Jesuits got to work on the Pope. His Holiness decreed that the said Galileo is to be interrogated with regard to his intention, even with the threat of torture, and is to be condemned to imprisonment, as the Holy Congregation thinks best, and ordered not to treat further in any way at all, either verbally or in writing, of the mobility of the earth and the stability of the sun. Otherwise, he will incur the penalties for relapse. Six days later, the sentence was read to Galileo at the convent of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, and he recanted. I, Galileo, son of the late Vincenzo Galilei, Florentine, aged 70 years, swear that I have always believed, do believe, and with God's help will in the future believe all that is held, preached, and taught by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. I have been judged to be vehemently suspected of heresy, that is, of having held and believed that the sun is the center of the world and immobile, and that the earth is not the center and moves. Therefore, with sincere heart and unpretended faith, I abjure, curse, and detest the aforesaid errors and heresies. And if I should violate, which God forbid, any of these my promises and oaths, I submit myself to all the castigations and penalties imposed and promulgated in the sacred canons. So help me God and these holy gospels which I touch with my hands. His condemnation was a crushing blow to Galileo. He wrote to his daughter, a Franciscan nun, that his name had been erased from the Book of the Living. He was allowed to return to his home at Arcetri, near Florence, close by her convent. She did his penance for him by reciting the penitential psalms, and he remained confined to his estate under the supervision of the Inquisition. His health was poor. Next year, his daughter died, to his great grief. Yet he managed to resume work and to receive visitors. John Milton came here to see him. And he still believed that his new science was consistent with Catholic teaching. God, he said, had written two books, Nature and Scripture, in different languages. Nature was written in the exact language of mathematics, Scripture in the less precise language of men. I believe that the Holy Bible is often very abstruse and can mean things quite different from what its bare words signify. Nature, on the other hand, is inexorable and immutable. The great book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures. Nature never transgresses the laws imposed upon her. For that reason, nothing which since experience sets before our eyes or necessary demonstrations prove to us ought to be called into question, much less condemned upon the testimony of biblical passages which may have some different meaning beneath their words. For the Bible is not chained to conditions as strict as those which govern physical effects. Nor is God any less excellently revealed in nature's actions than in the Bible. 
I do not believe that God who has endowed us with senses, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. He would not require us to deny sense and reason in physical matters which are set before our eyes and minds by direct experience or necessary demonstrations. Galileo was a great realist. He thought he could read the book of nature and find in it certain and final truths just as the church got them from reading scripture. It was a dogmatic age. People pitched their claims high. All Galileo wanted was a nice partition between science and theology that would leave the scientists free to get on with it. And then they'd finish basic science pretty quickly. Well, they got their freedom, but they didn't finish science. On the contrary, it's changed, grown, been transformed at an accelerating rate ever since. In our own century, astronomy has gone through a transformation as profound as that of which Galileo himself was part. Our very concepts of space and time and matter have been transformed. Our instruments can now cover ranges of magnitude in space and time, billions of times greater than before. And many people wonder about the religious implications of the amazing new cosmology that's now opening up. They ask, for example, if the Big Bang, the idea that the universe about us is the dying echo of a huge cosmic explosion, if that idea is the same as the idea of the creation of the world in religion. But to think in that way is surely to repeat the kind of mistake that the church made in condemning Galileo, as if it were a matter of reconciling two different dogmas. And science is not dogmatic anymore, and religion is catching its spirit. Yesterday's orthodoxy we see now is today's heresy. Today's orthodoxy will be laughed at tomorrow. All theories have a limited life. There are no fixed positions anymore. They'll all crumble and be replaced by others. The truth now is not in the fixed positions. It's in the quest. Alas, your friend and servant Galileo has for the last month been irredeemably blind so that this heaven, this earth, this universe, which I, by my discoveries and clear demonstrations, had enlarged a hundred times beyond what had been believed by wise men of past ages, for me is from this time forth shrunk into so small a space as to be filled by my own sensations. Today, news has come of the loss of Signor Galilei, which touches not just Florence, but the whole world and our whole century. Now, envy ceasing, the sublimity of that intellect will begin to be known, that will serve posterity as guide in the search for truth. It all happened a long time ago. But Galileo had made a permanent difference to our understanding of the universe. He'd made science mathematical and mechanistic, as it still is. He'd wanted to free science from any necessary connection with ideas of purpose and value. And he succeeded. Science became a kind of abstract diagram of nature. But when the universe is seen in this way, it no longer looks so friendly to man. It doesn't give him guidelines in the old way. It's stripped of its old religious and moral significance. Its God, if any, is a cosmic mathematician rather than a heavenly king and father. How would faith respond to the bleakness of this new vision of the universe? The condemnation of Galileo did not put an end to Italian science, but it certainly increased the attractions of lands further north, where conditions were easier. The liveliest centre was Paris. It was here that the implications of the new science for faith were seen at their starkest. 
the man with the clearest sense of how the human situation had changed was himself a gifted mathematician and scientist. He touched the scientific revolution at many points. Our altimeters depend on the regular relation between air pressure and altitude that he first demonstrated. A Paris bus still runs along a route he planned, the world's first scheduled public transport service, from the Bastille to the Luxembourg. And modern computers descend from his mechanical calculating machines. His name was Blaise Pascal. And this is the computer that Pascal made in 1652. It may be a trifle crude, but it works. Pascal was brought to Paris by his father in 1631, at the age of eight. His mother had died in his infancy, and the boy was educated by the father for precocity. Precocious he was, he published his first book on the conic sections in geometry at the age of 17. After that, his reputation grew rapidly, and he met the leading thinkers of the day. The Parisian intelligentsia at that time were fired with enthusiasm for the new learning. They were organized into a number of informal societies. In private rooms packed with scientific instruments, they met weekly and even daily to exchange ideas and news from abroad. At one such gathering, Pascal met the philosopher René Descartes. Descartes had become the leading exponent of the new mechanistic science and was an uncompromising rationalist. He proved God's existence by abstract arguments and then used God to certify the validity of human reason and the existence of the mechanical universe. After that, science took over. To Pascal, who was an intensely Christian personality, such lip service to religion was abhorrent. I cannot forgive Descartes. In his whole philosophy, he would like to do without God, but he couldn't help allowing him a flick of the fingers to set the world in motion. After that, he had no more use for God. That metaphysical God, the God of the philosophers, was not the God Pascal was privately seeking. Publicly, Pascal was a gifted and sociable man with hundreds of friends and correspondents. They included figures as diverse as Queen Christina of Sweden, Christopher Wren, and Descartes. But in private, he was a less cheerful figure, often in poor health, and he felt the world was vanity. He writes in a note, human existence, inconstancy, boredom, anxiety. Hard scientific and mathematical researchers helped to combat the boredom, but Pascal was not an optimist about science in the modern manner. The effect of the new discoveries had been to break down people's traditional sense of their place in the universe. People felt like aliens, literally displaced persons. They were surrounded by giddying new vistas of greatness and littleness. In Pascal's mind, this sense of exile came together with his Christian understanding of sin, paradise lost, man's need for salvation, the contradictions of human nature. He planned a book to be addressed to his age that might show the way to faith. It takes the form, or was to take the form, of a long series of psychological explorations. But his notes for it survive. We call them his pensées, and they're a work of genius. The whole visible world is only an imperceptible dot in nature's ample bosom. No idea comes near it. To offer man an astounding prodigy, let him look into the tiniest things. Let a mite show him in its minute body incomparably more minute parts. Legs with joints, veins in its legs, blood in its veins, humors in the blood vapors in the drops. Let him divide these things still further till he has exhausted his powers of imagination. Our own human body is now a colossus compared to the nothingness beyond our reach. Of the two infinities of science, that of greatness is much more obvious. The eternal silence of these infinite spaces fills me with dread. 
when I survey the whole universe in its dumbness, and man left to himself with no light, as though lost in this corner of the universe, without knowing who put him there, what he has come to do, what will become of him when he dies, incapable of knowing anything, I am moved to terror. Man is only a reed, but he is a thinking reed. There is no need for the universe to take up arms to crush him. A vapor, a drop of water is enough to kill him. But even if the universe were to crush him, man would still be nobler than his slayer because he knows that he is dying. The universe knows nothing of this. Man's greatness comes from knowing that he is wretched. Let us consider the point and say, either God exists or he does not exist. But which of the alternatives shall we choose? Reason can determine nothing. A coin is being spun at the extreme point of this infinite distance which will turn up heads or tails. What is your bet? The God of Christians is not a God who is merely the author of mathematical truths and the order of the elements. He is a God who fills the soul and heart of those whom he possesses, who makes them inwardly conscious of their wretchedness and of his infinite mercy, who makes them incapable of any other end but him. It is the heart which perceives God, not the reason. The heart has its reasons, of which the reason knows nothing. From 1646, the Pascal family became involved in a religious movement centered on the convent of Port Royal. Port Royal's teaching stressed the corruption of nature and the need to break with the world and live a converted life. Pascal's sister Jacqueline was deeply influenced and wished to enter the convent. Both the father and Pascal opposed it. For one thing, there will be a very large dowry to be found. So there was tension in the family, which affected Pascal badly. But in 1651, the father died. Next year, Jacqueline entered the convent. Pascal settled in this house in Paris. He was alone now, having lost his father by death, one sister by marriage, and the other to the religious life. He was 30 years old, and his personal development was approaching its climax. The decisive experience came late on a Monday night in November 1654. It reconciled Pascal to his sister and committed him to Port Royal because he now saw that its teachings were the logical conclusion of his own thinking. The experience taught him something like this. God is hidden from the wise. The paradox of man's greatness and wretchedness, which so troubled Pascal, is met and resolved by an answering divine paradox of the concealment of God's glory in the weakness of Christ. Pascal finds his hidden God most deeply hidden and therefore most profoundly revealed in Christ's passion. That was a theory, but the experience when it came was overwhelming. He recorded it that night in a series of disconnected phrases. The Year of Grace, 1654, Monday the 23rd of November. From about half past ten in the evening until half past midnight. Fire. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Not of philosophers and scholars. Certainty. Certainty, heartfelt, joy, peace. God of Jesus Christ. God of Jesus Christ. My God and your God. Thy God shall be my God. 
world forgotten and everything except God. Greatness of the human soul. O oh, righteous father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee. Joy, joy, joy. Tears of joy. Pascal copied this record onto a piece of parchment. It was found sewn into his clothing when he died at the age of only 39. The religion of the Middle Ages was very public and objective because the language of faith shaped the very fabric of the perceived world. Faith and knowledge were held together. Now, Pascal was a Catholic believer, but in his day, faith and knowledge were beginning to come apart. As he says, God is known by the heart, not by the reason. Almost as if he means that his own religion was feeling expressed in biblical metaphors. Reason told him that our knowledge of the world has to be put in the language of number, and rule, and mechanism. And that's the problem of the sea of faith. And that's why we began as far back as Galileo. Faith postulates a personal control of events, a moral providence, unseen presences and powers, divine interventions. But over the centuries, our growing scientific knowledge has always excluded such ideas. The result has been to leave the language of faith out on a limb, dissociated, and therefore of uncertain meaning. It's gradually lost descriptive force and social authority. No age was so overwhelmingly dominated by the idea of the mechanical universe as the 19th century. Assuming that natural forces are predictable and controllable, they harnessed the elements of fire and air and water. They mechanized society too, with capitalism, double entry bookkeeping, bureaucracy and statistics. Yet in their religion, they were content simply to step back into the medieval world. And it's no use asking how could they do it, because we do just the same. Our theories, like our machines, may be getting less ponderously mechanical, but we describe our world in terms of number more than ever. Modern physics, modern electronics, and yet in this century, we flock to nativity plays and carol services. It's as if the supernatural and the mythical still casts a spell over us. We need to turn to it to counterbalance the worldview of modern science. angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. I remember singing those words at Christmas 1957 in my student days. It was just after Sputnik 1 had gone up and I suddenly felt a fool. Why was I celebrating a world that had passed away centuries ago? And it's not only at Christmas that we feel the appropriateness of traditional religious language, but also at times of personal crisis. In such moments, we become aware both of the modern world's dependence on science and of our continuing need of religion. But how do we fit those two thoughts together? I faced this question when, in the early 60s, I was a curate in Salford. Our last duty each evening was to go round the wards of this hospital, talking to patients about whatever they wanted to talk about. Now, the hospital itself is, of course, entirely based on modern, secular, scientific medicine. But many patients wanted to discuss their illness as a religious problem. A man dying of cancer said, 
Why is this happening to me? A woman who'd given birth to a handicapped child thought that God must be punishing her. Someone facing an operation said, Pray that I won't have to go through with it. Once I prayed with the relatives over a man with a brain tumour, and he subsequently recovered. They were convinced that it had been a miracle. I was stumped by many of the things that people said to me. Of course, it's natural enough to respond in a religious way to a crisis in one's life. We all do. But people clearly expected me to endorse highly supernaturalist interpretations of their sickness and recovery. But does God really send disease as a warning or a punishment, as the prayer book says he does? And if God sometimes heals people in answer to prayer, why doesn't he do it more regularly? And if any of these supernatural interpretations of disease are correct, then what were we doing in a modern hospital which is based on the idea that disease has natural causes and is controllable by human technology? In fact, of course, not even the most way out religious conservative seriously thinks that we can give up modern medicine. The change since Pascal's time has been that science has moved more and more into the human sphere and I was forced to try to work out an interpretation of what I was doing and what people were saying to me that was consistent with medical science. I think in those days I was already beginning to move away from the idea that religion offers a rival explanation of events or an auxiliary technology to be brought in when the doctors have failed. No, it's something quite different from that. I thought about the problem one night when I was called over here to a deathbed at three in the morning. There were no relatives present and the patient was alone and already unconscious. He lived only a few minutes. I gave him absolution and said the prescribed prayers. Afterwards, I asked myself what I'd done. It hadn't made any scientifically measurable difference to him. I didn't suppose that I'd magically altered his eternal destiny from what it would otherwise have been. Yet I felt it had been worthwhile turning out and hoped that when my time came, someone else would do the same for me. It seemed to me then as if religion was a way of affirming the value of human life from the first breath to the very last. It's up to us to give it that value, to affirm human dignity in the face of the indifferent universe.